I've had this MX-5 for three years now, and in that time I've done 25,000 miles, I've driven around Great Britain to most of its edges, I've done 2,500 miles in Europe, I did a little bit of drifting, by a little bit of drifting I mean I rented a low grip surface for 30 minutes and tried to practice sliding it and did a few donuts, and I've covered 2,000 miles on track, that's 15 track days I've done. And as a result of those track days and that bit of drifting, I lost my warranty. When Mazda thought there was a major issue with this car that was gonna cost a lot of money to fix, they stepped back and said, no, you've got to pay for it. More on that one later. Anyway, after three years, what's my opinion about this car and what's gone wrong? Firstly, I'm gonna start with the negatives, not because I wanna be negative about the car, if I was negative about this car, I wouldn't have it anymore. But because if you're thinking about a car, it's good to know what can go wrong. It's up to you whether or not it's actually an issue. First problem I had was one of these wheels, the paint started coming off one. And I was thinking, oh no, this is gonna to happen to all of them and it's gonna be a repeated issue. But no, actually, they replaced one of the wheels, it hasn't returned. So that was obviously just a bit unlucky that I've got a dodgy wheel. Another problem is the roof. Very common problem with these cars is that when you take the roof off, try and do that one-handed now like that, whilst holding the camera, what happens is this bit fouls the hoops as you push it down. Now the solution to it is to move this slightly further forward. It's what the dealer does. They put spaces down there somewhere to do it. And you can see now there's actually a gap between the roof and the hoop. Only a small one, but there is a tiny little gap there. So this doesn't get scratched and your roof doesn't wear away. Mazda know about it. Why they haven't resolved it from a factory yet, I don't know. An ongoing issue are the squeaky windows. And when I say squeaky, I don't mean a little bit. I mean this. How loud that comes across on camera, I don't know, but it's enough to disturb my neighbors and ask me, what's wrong with your car? Mazda think it's this. Now, this has actually been replaced twice. I thought they were replacing these rubber strips here, but when they last did it, I noticed these weren't changed. I was thinking, these are original. They're still dirty. They were dirty when I took it to the dealership and they're still dirty now. So I looked into it more and they've actually been replacing this bit here. They think the squeak comes from here. Now this could make a little bit of a squeak, but the sound I'm hearing is something hard on something else hard. So they have to remove this door card, take this whole thing off. It goes under the door along and comes up here. So I've got a nice new rubber bit here, but I don't think this ever needed to be changed because it's not made any difference to the squeakiness of the windows. Now the car is not under warranty. I'm going to investigate it myself when it's not so cold and I have a chance. I'm gonna take the door card off and see what's making that loud noise. From investigation, it turns out this does not have a half moon gear system that many electric windows have. It has a cable system, which is quite old fashioned and prone to failure. Quite often they do fail in this car. The cable snaps when the car is four, five, maybe six years old, and then the window doesn't go back up. And the law of sod will surely kick in and it will start raining as that happens. So I'm gonna investigate that and see if it is the cable, see if it's corroded, what's going on. But it's been doing it since the car is six months old. It does it sometimes, doesn't do it at other times. Usually it does it when it's wet. It's not doing it at the moment though. The reason why I'm sure it's not the rubbers making the noise is because if you look here, I can actually flex the window so it doesn't touch either side of the rubber, yet it still makes a horrendous sound. I can flex the window so it's not touching this rubber and I can flex it so it's not touching this rubber. My money is on the sound either coming from here, because this is quite firm, or from the mechanism behind the door. I need to investigate. Another issue I've had is the LCD screen. After about 18 months of ownership, it got moisture behind it. However, I forgot to do anything about it because the moisture went away and I forgot about it. But it happened again recently and that was replaced under warranty. Mazda did honor that side of the warranty. And an ongoing issue I'm probably not gonna resolve is the rattling airbag in the seat. This airbag here, it makes this sound. And the reason why I'm not gonna bother trying to resolve it is because it's a common problem. I could spend quite a bit of money replacing this airbag and it's only gonna happen again. And there's an easy solution. It only seems to make the noise when nobody is sitting in the seat. And that got me thinking, why not I just 
plug the seatbelt in. And that's exactly what I do. When it starts rattling, I just plug the seatbelt in and the noise goes away. So when the seatbelt's plugged in, something in here must change because I haven't heard it rattle with the seatbelt in yet. On the subject of seatbelts, there is a problem that this generation of MX-5 suffers from, and that is seatbelts that don't retract, as you can see. Now, I'm a little bit worried that one day I'm gonna take someone out in this car, and when they get out and close the door, well, you can see the problem. That's gonna cause some damage. So I have to remember to wind this back myself whenever I get out. There is a way to resolve it. You can pull it out and spray it with dry silicon lubricant, and then apparently that helps it go back on its own. But at the moment, I'm having to do that to make sure I don't damage the door jam. And now for the biggest yet smallest issue I've had with this car. This is my three year update. I've had the car for three years now, but last year when I had the car for two years, I did a two year update. And at the end of that video, I mentioned that I noticed a clicking sound coming from the back of the car. Winter came shortly afterwards because that was the end of October and uh, the clicking sound went away. I couldn't accelerate hard enough to make it click because there wasn't enough grip. However, spring came around and it returned and by summer that clicking sound was in full swing and worse than ever. It even got to the stage where I didn't actually have to accelerate that hard for it to make the sound. So I went to the Mazda dealership and they suspected that the car needed a new diff. It's a conical clutch style diff, which is news to me. I thought it was a Torsen. I can't remember the technical name. It's called a T or a Fuji. I'll put it on screen. But anyway, I thought I'd do some more investigation myself. So I mic'd up the diff and it made this sound. So I posted that video on Facebook and some helpful people heard it and said, that ain't no diff sound, that's the sound of your power plant frame flexing. It's basically a bit of metal that joins the gearbox to the diff. And the bolts had come slightly loose. And when I say loose, that's a relative term, still very tight, but not tight enough. And they said, tighten the bolts and hopefully that sound will go away. So I thought I'd give it a go. I lifted the car up, put it on axle stands, got under the car with my torque wrench, and I was trying to tighten it. And I could make the bolts a bit tighter, but I couldn't get the torque wrench to click because of the angle that I was at, I just, I didn't feel comfortable pulling any harder on that torque wrench whilst I was underneath it with it on axle stands. I value my life more than I do the car. So I took it to John Banks Mazda in Colchester, the dealership that looks after this car, they got it up in the air, I explained the problem, and they've got a good, good angle now it to give it some good pull with the torque wrench, and they got it to click, and the sound went away. It's fine. But, when Mazda thought there was something wrong with the diff, not Mazda the dealer, they wanted to help, but Mazda the manufacturer, they said they weren't gonna cover it under warranty. Over 2,000 pounds to replace that diff, they said they're not gonna cover it under warranty because they got video of me taking it on track and video of me doing skids in it. And that's not the way you normally use this car. Now, I agree. It's not the way you normally use this car. The majority of owners don't take their car on track days and they don't do skids in it. But it's a Mazda MX-5. It may not be the normal way you use this car, but it's something this car can do. It's something this car is designed to do. They design it with track driving in mind. It can take 1.4 G in the bends and still maintain oil pressure. Not all cars can do that. So I think Mazda knows it's capable on track. Mazda knows it's reliable, but they found a way to get out of covering the warranty and they did. So for that, I'm disappointed in them. And that brings me on to the reliability of this engine. It's rather good. The Skyactiv G, it's been around for 10 years. This higher output version has been around for five years, but it has a lot in common with the lower powered version. They just don't seem to go wrong. I don't know anyone, I haven't heard of anyone that's had a problem with this engine. Let me know in the comments if you know someone or you've had a problem with this engine yourself. They just work. 2016 models had a problem with their gearboxes. They can fail, but they updated the gearbox and certainly by September 2018, when the higher powered version of the two liter came out, 
they seem to have resolved that issue. They have a dual mass flywheel now and you don't seem to get gearbox issues. So although this car does have niggly problems like seat belts that don't retract properly and squeaky windows, its meat and potatoes are solid. However, if you were to modify the engine, then you may have problems, particularly with the gearbox. They don't like more power than the standard power. What I do like though, and I mentioned this in my last update, are these rubber strips. And here, and all cars have them here to be fair. It just keeps the engine bay clean. Look at that, 25,000 miles, where's the dirt? Although the aluminium rocker cover is starting to get a little bit of corrosion on it. So I may have to clean that up come the spring. I totally understand if you think that this is more of a rant video than an update video. And that's because whenever something goes wrong with this car or whenever I have a problem, I feel I have a responsibility to make a mental note or even write it down to let you know when I do my next update. And you can decide whether or not that problem actually matters to you. Now, do all these little problems actually stop me from enjoying this machine? Not one iota. I absolutely adore this car. And I'm not gonna go over all the reasons why and all the features I like because I've already done that. I'll leave a link to a video up there where I did that when I did my first review of this car after owning it for a year. What I will do is I'll give you a brief overview. It just makes me feel good. When I walk up to it, I think that's a good looking car. And even my other half mentions it sometimes and she doesn't care about cars. She never really mentions them. When I sit in it, I'm low down, so there's a low center of gravity, and I see that nice long bonnet in front of me, and I'm sitting near the pivot point of the car. In a hatchback or an SUV, you sit quite far forwards. When you steer, you sort of sway with the front of the car, but at the moment, I'm sitting nearer the back, nearer the pivot point, making it feel more agile. It doesn't really suffer from oversteer or understeer. On track, you can bring which one you like up on demand. Go into the corner too fast, it's gonna understeer a little bit. Give a bit too much gas, it's gonna oversteer. Come off the gas at the right time, yes, you're gonna oversteer. You can demand what you want. I feel like I have more control over the chassis than I do in a hatchback. It handles well. Yes, it will go around a circuit slower than an Audi RS3, quite a bit slower, but although it has less grip than an RS3, I think it handles better handling and grip are different things. Handling is about how you can make the chassis dance. It's throttle adjustable. I can do donuts if I want. I can make it slide. It's just fun. And on the road, where well, you can't do those things, what you do have is a revy engine, a snappy gearbox, and you can take the roof off, which just makes everything feel better. Except for today, because it's windy, gloomy, and damp, and I'm feeling cold. So the roof is staying on, and I'm keeping my orange fleece on. But on a day that's sunny and cold, I can take the roof off, put the heating on, and even if it's five degrees outside, I'm still comfortable. But I have the best of both worlds. If I am feeling cold like I am today, I can put the roof on and have a cozy environment. But that's my subjective opinion of why I enjoy this car so much. Should I get back to some of the problems? I'm going to. I've made a list, I've been making a list and keeping a mental note, so I'm gonna go through the few that are left. The touchscreen. With Android Auto, the touchscreen doesn't work. Now, this doesn't bother me because I have a car with a touchscreen and I have a car with this system, which is supposed to be a touchscreen when you're stationary, but not when you're moving. But if you're using Android Auto, it's just never a touchscreen. I prefer this system. I've got into the habit over three years, or not in the habit, I'm experienced enough that I know exactly what I need to do with this to make whatever I want happen on there with barely taking my eyes off the road. So I think that this system's actually safer. The fact it's not a touch screen when Android Auto's on or when you're moving is the passenger. It confuses my other half. She's always trying to press and get it to work and I have to remind her, no, it's this down here. And because she's not used to this and she doesn't use it as often as I do, she finds it annoying. But for me, I prefer this system. The wiper blades are rubbish. They are about 50 quid for a set from Mazda. I may be wrong on that price. It's been 
about a year and a half since I bought some, but they don't seem to last very long and you get streaks from where you wipe. You can get a different brand of wiper blade, but I want the original ones because they have a nice look about them. I like how sleek they are and they kind of just make that look out the front window. If I was to fit some other ones, I think it would look a bit odd. Anything else? First gear is stiff. I've mentioned this before in other videos and yes, it's still stiff when it's cold. If I want to get first gear these days, what I tend to do is just put it in the third and then first. If you're rolling, it's not a problem. If it's summer, it's much less of a problem, but winter and cold like now, it just doesn't want to go into first. Clutch judder when cold. This is not just this car. I find this is the case with other Skyactiv G engines. When it's cold and you're moving away, sometimes the clutch can sort of judder a bit. You can get around it by giving extra gas, but I feel like I'm giving too much gas to get it going. But once I've moved away three or four times, it goes away. It's a very small issue. I'm telling you that because you may think there's something wrong with your clutch if you've got an MX-5. I've had this from new. I've had the same problem with a Mazda 3. It just seems to be the way they are. I haven't noticed the problem with the 2019 onwards Mazda 3. I'm talking about the previous generation, which was 2013 or 14 to 2019. I don't know the exact date, but that area, it tends to judder when it's cold when you're first setting off. Um, you have to clean the drains out. So the roof uh, has some drains down there which is like a sponge and a, a basket that catches leaves. If you don't clean those out, and they're quite awkward to get to, you can flood your car. So it rains, those drains are blocked, water doesn't go down the drain, it goes inside your car. And many owners have had that problem where they've got to their car and this carpet is just soaking wet. And even if you clean those drains, there's actually another hole that can get blocked where you have to remove a lot of this trim back here to get to it to unblock it. I cleaned my drains recently and they were actually okay, not too bad, but I did have a half cover on the car for most of the time I've had it so far. Fortunately, recently, I haven't needed a half cover because I don't want to say joy, seem joyful that my neighbor has left. I quite like my neighbor, but he did have two cats and they like to go on the roof and I've had soft tops in the past damaged by cats. So it was a new car, didn't want to get this one damaged. I thought I'll keep a half cover on it. Now those cats aren't here, I leave the half cover off it and I actually use the car more. I've only done 5,000 miles this year, whereas the second year I did 10, no nine the second year, and the year before I did 11. So I've actually done less. That's because my other half got a new car and be using that quite a bit. That took us around Europe this year. Uh, I've just had, I've done less long journeys in it and I've done less track days this year but mileage is lower, but how regular I'm using it is more. I've done a lot more shorter or local trips in it, using it more often, but with less distance. And I've actually enjoyed it that way because I've been on the motorway less and I've been in the country enjoying it more as it should be. And yeah, that's my list of problems done. You probably can't see it on camera, but having the half cover on has really scratched up these black A pillars. I don't think I can get it on camera here, but you can see it in person. I'm not gonna bother changing them because these get changed when you get a new windscreen. So I'm just gonna wait until one day I need a new windscreen, which I'm sure is inevitable, it's gonna happen at some point, and then they will be replaced. But that's a reason not to have a cover if you can avoid one. The reason why I drive it more now, I don't have the half cover, it's just, it's a palaver, taking that cover off, finding somewhere to put it, particularly when it's wet, just put me off getting in the car. I'll just get in my other car. So now I don't have to mess about with that faff, I drive it a lot more often. I ran out of time yesterday, 3 p.m. and it was dark. Such is the problem with making videos at this time of the year. But look at this, new dawn and new mood. It rained a lot last night and I think all the clouds are on the floor. The temperature is warmer, the sky is blue, the sun's shining, the wind has gone, the roof has gone, the roof is off. And that's another thing I like about driving this car. At the moment, I'm doing 30 miles per hour, yet I'm enjoying myself more than if I was in a hatchback. There's something about having the roof off that heightens the experience of motoring. It makes even sedate speeds feel more pleasurable. It's nice, I can feel the wind in my hair a little bit, I'm in the atmosphere of the earth and it feels like summer. I should have taken my fleece off because I'm getting hot in here 
I'm going to turn that heating down. I am actually starting to feel like I might sweat in a moment if I don't turn that down. And I never really used to like convertibles. I was always thinking, why would you want one of those? Heavier, less rigid, less performance. Coupes, that's where you want to go. Uh, until I experienced a convertible, then my opinion changed. An ex-girlfriend of mine had an MR2 Roadster, the Mark III. And since I experienced that car, and that opened up my eyes to driving lower powered, lightweight cars without a roof, I've not been without a lightweight convertible since then. That was 2014, I've had one ever since. And I can't imagine, well I can imagine, I wouldn't want to be without one. And it's not even that expensive, it's the price of a normal car really. I could be spending a lot more money right now, guzzling a lot more fuel, yet enjoying myself less. On the subject of cost, a full set of Michelin PS5 tyres for this car, so really good tyres, is £600. Now £600 is a lot of money, but for a full set of Michelin PS5s, it's not a lot of money. Brakes are affordable as well, brakes cost the same amount as a Ford Focus, that kind of price level. Ordinary car prices, but I don't want to use that word. I'm not going to use that word because it's not. I was going to say supercar fun. It's not supercar fun and it's not a supercar, but it's not ordinary levels of enjoyment. It's more. And in some ways, in some ways, maybe it is more enjoyable than a very expensive high performance car because when I do get to the country road, I actually get to use the performance and I get to rev the engine. Not only are the tyres affordable, but tyre wear is good. It has 50-50 weight distribution, front and rear. The rear wheels do the pushing and the front wheels do the steering and more of the braking. So you do actually get very even tyre wear from rear to front. But also because it's got double wishbone suspension up front and a multi-link setup at the back, multi-link and double wishbone are sort of the same thing. They, they're packaged in a different way, but they achieve the same thing. You get even tyre wear across the width of the tyre. The tyre's always flat against the road, meaning that not only are the tyres affordable, I find you get more life out of them as well, because your car uses them efficiently. But with some cars that have less capable suspension systems, it doesn't matter how well you set them up, how perfect you get the geometry, you're still going to get uneven tyre wear, especially if you drive it on track. Whereas this car, it's done multiple track days, yet the tyres wear evenly, and I get my money's worth out of them. What about cost? How much has this car cost me? Well, I've had it three years now, and it's depreciated by about £11,000, which is what I was expecting. I bought it for £30,000, and I was thinking it would be worth about 20 after three years. The first year, it didn't seem to depreciate at all, but that's because used car prices were silly. The second year, it come down a bit, come down by about £5,000, but now, looking at the market, it seems to be worth around about £19,000. I'm happy with that, considering what it's given me. How much is that per year? £3,500 per year or something? I'm happy to pay that for this machine. And if I keep it longer, which is likely, it's only going to get cheaper as depreciation will reduce as the car gets older. And on the subject of age, that brings me to, unfortunately, um, another problem with the car. Not a problem for me, because, well, it might be one day, but it's certainly not a problem now, and that's rust. The ND, this generation of MX-5, also rusts. MX-5s are known for rust issues when they get old, 15 years old plus, say, usually when they start to become an issue. And looking at the underneath of this car, I think this is going to be the same. It's only three years old. I tend to use it less in the wet. When it's raining, I'm more likely to get in my other car, so this gets used less in the wet. Not that I avoid driving in the wet, it's wet today. But the rust I can see underneath this car that is starting to appear is already starting to look worse than my 10 year old or nearly 10 year old Seat Lown that has 203,000 miles on it. And this has 25,000 miles on it. So I think that in a few years time when these cars start to get a bit older, rusty ND MX-5s are gonna be 
common. I'm not saying the rust is bad right now, I think it's fine, it's very minor and it doesn't concern me, but when I compare this three-year-old car to my nearly 10-year-old Leon, I can see this looks worse. The pinch welds on my Leon are rust-free. There's rust starting to appear on the pinch welds of this car and on the chassis rails, I'm starting to see rust there. Minor, but it's there. So although it's not a problem for me at the moment, I'm not worried about, I do think in the future when these cars are 15, 20 years old, that may be the reason why they get scrapped. This car took me by surprise a couple of days ago because I was parking at the side of the road and the brakes suddenly activated and stopped the car in a jerky manner. Made me jump. I didn't even know the car could do that and it said brake on the dashboard and I was thinking, why has that happened? And I thought there's a pedestrian walking on the pavement. Maybe it thought I was going to hit that pedestrian. But that's actually a good sign because I've had the car for three years and the system has only malfunctioned once in three years. I didn't even know the car could do that. Whereas other cars I drive with these systems, well, I wouldn't have to have them for three years to notice that they malfunction. I wouldn't have to have them for a couple of weeks often before they do a phantom brake. So the system that Mazda uses seems to be one of the better, more reliable systems, including their automatic cruise control. It's one of the better systems I've used. This car doesn't have it, but the Mazda 3 does. And I find it seems to go wrong a lot less than some other manufacturer's systems. It doesn't do that phantom braking. It's stable and it makes me feel comfortable. Some people accuse this car of not being a sports car. Why? Because it can accelerate from zero to 60 in a similar time that it takes a Toyota RAV4 Prime plug-in hybrid, about six and a half seconds. But to say that is basically to say that you don't know what a sports car really is. A sports car is not a dragster. It's not about naught to 60. And this car, in my opinion, is the definition of a sports car. If there was a dictionary that had the word sports car in it, just write Mazda MX-5. Don't bother with a description, just say this car. And it's in a league of its own, really, because what else can you buy that's like this car? 20 years ago, you could have the MGTF or the MR2 Roadster, or even the Fiat Barchetta, maybe a bit longer than 20 years ago now for that one. But these days, there's nothing else. You used to have the Fiat 124, but that went off sale recently, or even probably a couple of years ago now. Time does go fast. Okay, you could say the BMW Z4. That's a very good car. So is a BMW 3 Series. And I think a Z4 drives more like a 3 Series than a sports car. And a 3 Series is a family car. A good one, but it is a family car. Put some power in it, give it a limited slip differential and you have something very special indeed. What about a Porsche Boxster? That's always on my list. I'm always interested in those, but, and I say but, it's more like a supercar, for me at least. When I was growing up, cars with that level of performance were supercars and I haven't changed. My physical body has not changed. I experience forces in the same way. So a Boxster now, although it is a sports car, performance-wise, it's the equivalent of a supercar from not that long ago. What I'm saying is, is what else can you buy that has this kind of performance in this kind of package now? There's nothing. Can't think of anything. But I guess that's it. We've got to move with the times and cars have just got faster and faster. But once you get much faster than this car, in my opinion, you're taking away from some of the pleasure. Yes, you get that catapult acceleration, which is fun and a little bit addictive, but you can get that from most electric cars. But when you have a lot of performance, it's hard to use it. And for me, that takes away some of the joy. This car is a sports car, and the reason why I believe it's a sports car is because when I get in it, it doesn't make me feel like I'm wearing a suit or slippers. It makes me feel like I'm wearing trainers and a tracksuit and I've been working out for years. I'm fit and ready, ready to get physical. I'm not, I'm not very fit, but that's how it makes me feel. Come to think of it, that may be one of the reasons why I like this car so much. It makes me feel younger, it makes me feel more agile than I am because it's an agile machine. 
maybe that's why quite a lot of older people drive MX-5s. I've always wondered that. I do notice that although young people do drive MX-5s, quite often when you see the person behind the wheel, it is an older person. Maybe it makes them feel younger too. That might be why they enjoy it without even maybe realising it. This is the 2 litre with a 0 to 60 of about 6.5 seconds, but don't discount the 1.5 that has a 0 to 60 of about 8 seconds. In some ways that can be more fun. It's got a softer suspension, so it's more comfortable on the road. At least it seems to have softer suspension to me. Slightly less grip, so you feel like you're on your tiptoes a bit more, but you get to drive it harder. And I actually find driving lower powered cars harder, more fun than driving higher powered cars slower which is why I probably don't have a box star. I've been looking at them for years, but especially the latest ones, they just seem too powerful. I feel like, when am I gonna put my foot down? If I'm gonna get the 60 in like five seconds, it's all over. You've got 300 horsepower from the base model. 300 horsepower from the base. I don't think I'm gonna be enjoying that power on the road because I'm not gonna be able to use it. One of my favourite cars to drive, actually, I'll come clean, is a Fiat Panda. They're great fun. Especially the lowest power one you can get. You just drive it as hard as you like and you're driving sensibly within the speed limit. What I like about this is it is a happy medium. It's, it's in between there. It's fast enough that I can enjoy it on track, but it's not so fast that I can't enjoy it on the road. When I was growing up, my friend's stepdad had a Toyota Supra and I loved going out in that. It was the Mark III one. And that actually has similar performance to this. Not top speed, but acceleration wise, they're similar. And that was not a slow car back then. No way did anyone say that was a slow car back in the 90s. I've been driving around for 12 miles now and 44.6 miles per gallon. So the car does not break the bank when it comes to how much fuel you use. I've been driving a bit slower than usual today because, well, look at the conditions. It's wet and slippery. The roads were salted a few days ago and that tends to make them a bit more slippery than usual. But even if I was able to put my foot down, I rarely get lower than 33. In fact, on the road, I don't think I've ever got lower than 33. Generally, to get lower than that, I have to take it on track. I guess the purpose in a car review is to try and help you figure out whether or not you want one. Well, I'm going to say this. If you like driving, you must, I'll underline that, must, experience an MX-5. Don't write them off. Try one first and then decide if it's the car for you. If you don't try one, you're probably missing out. I need to add a caveat to my advice that you must at least try an MX-5 if you enjoy driving. And that caveat is, if you're over six foot, you may struggle with it. A little bit small if you're that tall. I'm five foot 10 and if I was much taller, I don't think I would like this car. Some people are six foot and six foot plus and they find them fine. I think it depends how long you are in the leg compared to the torso, but six foot plus, you may struggle. Try sitting in one first before you try one. I know I've been driving the car quite sedately today, but look at the weather. It's not exactly ideal conditions for driving quickly on a country road. But if you do want to see me driving it quick on track, I'll leave a link to a video in the top right hand corner of your screen. Despite my whining about all the problems I've listed over the three years I've had this car, I'm not getting rid of it. It's staying until something else comes along that sparks my interest. Maybe the next MX-5. There's an updated version coming next year, but it's not enough of a change. It's got adaptive cruise control and a few other features, better diff, but that's not enough to make me buy another new car. And it's gonna be hard to pull me away from this one because the color scheme, the red, the black, and the white, and the stitching here, I know they all get this stitching, but the color choices in this car is what makes me like the design so much. So. When the next MX-5 comes along, hopefully that comes in some nice color choices as well. Hopefully it's a better car, we'll see. If you found the video helpful, please give it a thumbs up. Subscribe to get my future videos, and until the next one, cheerio.